If you want to look around the room, you are seeing the faces of all the people that turn up to seminars early. <laughs> because today we have an overwhelming number of people wanting to come and you'll notice there's no one standing around the wall, a couple of people, not many. And it's because anyone that wasn't actually here earlier, we've shunted off to another location. First time we've ever had to do this, but we've got another big theatre next door that's set up with, I don't know, video linkages, hopefully they can even hear what we're saying now, so they'll know that they're the ones that came late. <laughs> so congratulations on you all for coming on time. Look, we have so many special people here today um, for this very special presentation for Martin that it's hard for me to actually um, introduce you all, but I do want to give a very warm welcome. Um, it's great to have his close family and friends here as well, and um, Dean here, and many very special people have come today to listen to Martin's talk. And it really is a very special talk because Martin's probably the only one in the world that could give a talk looking at the history of a 40-year-old research group in photovoltaics that he himself initiated, and a group which has very much led the world for almost all of that period of time in terms of holding world records for things like silicon cell efficiencies, module efficiencies, and a whole range of other things. Martin's going to give us some insight into that 40 years of history and some of the achievements uh, of that group over that period of time. Now, Ziv normally, with these sorts of presentations, gets the supervisor of someone to introduce them because the supervisor knows most about them. But you see, Martin was the one that started this group 40 years ago, so we've had to reverse it. So I was the student, Martin was the supervisor, so I get the privilege of uh, introducing Martin today. And it's got a little bit of deja vu about it, doesn't it? Because it's only a couple of months ago that we had the 40-year celebration where I was kind of giving the introduction to Martin at that time. And most of what I said that day, I could just repeat now because it is all very relevant, I think, to uh, Martin and the presentation that Martin will give. Because from my perspective, you know, when I started a PhD in the early 1980s, I looked around the world to see who I thought was the best researcher in the world in photovoltaics, and, and in my view, it was very clear that Martin was that person. And so um, I felt very, very privileged to have Martin as my supervisor. And since that time, my, in my I guess, opinion that Martin is the world's best photovoltaic researcher has simply gone from strength to strength. And uh, I would challenge anyone to try and disagree with me on that topic. I definitely think Martin is the world's number one photovoltaic researcher and has been for probably 39 of the 40 years. It took him a year to get established. So <laughs> probably I don't need to say much more. I mean, a couple of months ago when I was introducing Martin, I was able to present to him and Judy bottles of champagne and the like. I can't do that today. But I do have a bottle of water <laughs> because if Martin starts talking about all of his achievements and the achievements of the group, he'll be very dry and very hoarse before he gets finished. So, Martin, I'll hand over to you. We're all looking forward and quite excited to hear what you have to say about uh, the achievements of the group and the history of the group, and here's a bottle of water to keep you going. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Stuart, for that uh, introduction. So what I'm going to do over the next 40 minutes is talk about my 40 years here at the university. So uh, if you look at that, that's an acceleration factor of about 500,000 times. So obviously I won't be able to touch upon everything that's happened during that period, but uh, hopefully I'll touch upon some things that are interesting. I'll just get back to the start here. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so this is some of the things that I'll touch upon. So at the moment, I'm director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics that involves not only UNSW, but um, four other universities around the country, as well as CSIRO. And that centre's funded by ARENA. And uh, I know there's some ARENA reps here today, but that's, that uh, support has been um, you know, very welcome. Well, just... Uh, I started here in 1974, so it was actually the end of last year. I actually gave this talk the end of last year. I've changed a little bit. I've made it a little bit more technical, seeing we're doing it in the, in the Tyree Energy Technology Building. But this is a shot from 1974 of the university. So um, I didn't really regard it as a new university then. It seemed like to me it had been well established, so there was no thought of it being new. But um, you know, when you look at it, you'll see that it, that, that it is. This young guy at the front there, probably a septuagenarian now, but 
he's taken his tennis court to play on the tennis courts, which are actually here where this building is presently located. And this is the electrical engineering building where a lot of our activity happened. You can see how long I've been here when you look at my record with vice chancellors. I've had the privilege of serving under seven of the eight vice chancellors here at the university. So you'll note over recent years, they've become a lot more colorful. <laughs> but that really, um, you know, I have been here for a large part of the university's history, although the university did seem like it had been here forever when I did arrive. This, uh, the 70s were a big hair, big hair era, and this is me <laughs> in 76 with my first PhD student, Bruce Godfrey. So many of you, you might know Bruce, he went on, he has gone on to have a distinguished career in the Australian energy sector. So he was um, chief executive of the Energy Research and Development Corporation and um, CEO of ceramic fuel cells. And uh, now he acts as advisor to, to various government agencies, charge of the energy program at the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. But what we're doing here is uh, measuring a solar cell. So we had a very simple simulator. Um, Bruce had managed to scrounge up this microscope lamp. That was our solar simulator. And then we had these filter wheels. One of them was empty, so we could shine the full intensity of the light through. And the rest just filtered out different colors so we could test the cell under different colors of the spectrum. And this, for a long time, was our standard testing station, this little metal box here that uh, I think we found lying around. Um, so very simple, but this is the type of thing we were measuring. So this is a bit of solar cell physics. I won't go too much into that today, but just some of the terms might, if I explain what I mean, it might just make a, some of the other stuff more um, accessible. But this is a current voltage curve from a solar cell. So you get a current out from a voltage, uh, from a solar cell into voltage, and the power you get out is the product of the two. So this is showing voltage along here and current up here. So with zero, with zero voltage, you get the short circuit current and at zero current, you get the open circuit voltage and you get your maximum power somewhere between those two around this point of the curve here. Um, so this depends on the optical design of the cell, mainly the short circuit current. This depends upon the electronic structure that you build into the cell, which is where we focused our initial efforts. And this depends upon the electrical design of the cell. So, you know, different factors have an influence upon them. But the interesting thing was about this measurement with this very simple gear and very simple structures we were measuring was we were able to turn the lamp up bright enough that we got the type of current you'd expect out of a standard solar cell getting generated within the cell. And then we measured the open circuit voltage. And this value here was 618 millivolts, which doesn't sound all that great by present standards, but it was in fact one of the highest voltages that had ever been measured for a silicon solar cell. So that sort of set the tone for our early research activity. Uh, we presented these results in the US in 1976, and we did a massive tour of the US um, by car, where we visited just about every research group that was active in the US and every there many young startup companies in the in the area. So we visited all those as well. So really got to meet most of the people involved in photovoltaics in the US on that trip. So I call it an on the road trip, a bit like uh, Jack Kerouac's. So not quite as much sex, drugs and well, rock and roll, but I guess it would have been jazz. But we, we, we really had a very uh, interesting trip and lots of adventures on the way. Uh, we were much more focused than uh, Jack and his crew in that we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to visit as many people as possible and see what they were up to, see how they had established their labs. And we learned an enormous amount. I'd got a few tips about um, packing our itinerary to the fullest from my wife, Judy, by this stage of my career. So we had a really, um, a really hectic trip, you know, visiting at least two labs a day, uh, wherever we could do that. So packed a lot in and learned a lot. We came back to Australia. Our previous work had been done, you know, scrounging resources from around the place, but we established our own lab. So this was the Solar Photovoltaic Laboratory with a grant from the Utah Foundation, who we acknowledge here. They uh, helped us buy this uh, fume cupboard and uh, DI water system. And then Lou Davies, uh, who fortunately, unfortunately is no longer with us, but he was uh, head of the school or head of my department when I joined the university. He was a part-time industry um, academic professor here and uh, he helped me line up uh, grants and old equipment from his uh, main 
company AWA. So we set up this evaporator here, which I think is still the one that we use. So it's had a 40 year history as well. Um, this is the type of cell that we made in the early days. So we were interested in this very specific cell structure called the MIS structure, but this is a normal solar cell shown over here and you introduce dopants to get the electronic properties that you need from the silicon material. But instead of doing it the standard way, we wanted to do it this way here by using metals to control the, to give the same effect as the dopants. When you add the dopants to the silicon, you degrade its, its quality in one sense or another. So uh, if you can make the same structure without the dopants, you could be ahead. So uh, when I conceived this MISIM structure, I thought like this has got to be the ultimate solar cell. This is just looking at the energy levels in the device, but it's just sort of like a slippery slide, the carriers slide down the hill and everything's perfect about it. We ended up giving up on this line of research, but it's recently been revived. So there are now a lot of groups that are following up this uh, line of investigation now using more advanced materials and so on that we had uh, access to. But that was our early structure. The, um, the um, difficulty with this structure might seem a bit obvious from this drawing here. You've got to get the light through the metal and metal is not really good at letting light through. So we went through a slightly different structure where we made very fine metal lines right over the surface. So this requires a bit more sophisticated technology, which we mastered quite quickly. Um, so this was a structure here with very fine lines of metal that you can that run this way in this cell structure with, with spaces between them, bare silicon between them. And this structure allowed us to start getting onto the record books um, in, in terms of the open circuit voltage of the devices that we were able to make here. They weren't terribly efficient, but they had these great open circuit voltages. This is me in the lab. As a young ac academic here, I got loaded up with uh, lecturing. So I was sort of lecturing around the clock, marking chutes and all that kind of stuff. So didn't get all that much time to get into the lab and make the cells, but my job was measuring them. Um, so measured some quite good results, as you'll see here. So this is the open circuit voltage, and I mentioned 618 before, which is down here somewhere else. But this was our early claim to fame. NASA Lewis had set up a program to improve silicon cell or cell performance by increasing the open circuit voltage. So there was this sort of international com competition on to improve the open circuit voltage of the cell. And it was like uh, UNSW versus the rest of the world. We quickly shot ahead and sort of kept increasing our leads in terms of the voltages that we could get, get out. So, um, you know, 650 millivolts, we were the first to get above that. And then we got very close to 700 millivolts over the first year of act activity in this area. So with such a large lead over the other groups who were working on this, it, you know, we had to turn this into an efficiency advantage. So that became the focus of what we did. And um, we hit the jackpot in 1983, this very happy group here the group that set the first world record within our labs for solar cell efficiency performance. So we got 18% efficiency. So most commercial cells these days, you know, if it's not 18% efficient, you're not quite at the cutting edge, but um, that was a world record for that particular era. And uh, most of the people that were involved with that are listed here. Um, um, just uh, Mike Willison, who was uh, the one with Bruce and me when we, um, when we visited um, NASA Lewis, and um, Bruce Godfrey, who you've already met as my first PhD student. But the others here, um, Andy Blakers, who's head of a solar institute down at ANU and part of ACAP as well. He was my second PhD student. Stuart, who introduced me, was my third PhD student. Uh, Eric and Ted, we, we paid as professional officers. Uh, Eric was great on electronics and everything. He looked after electronics, anti-reflection coding design. Computing was a lot more difficult in those days. You couldn't just sort of get your personal computer out and, and, and do a calculation. You'd take a bunch of cards up to the mainframe computer and stick them through. So, so we bought our Eric, um, you know, like the equivalent of a desktop. It was something, you know, about half the size of this desk that he had in the corner of his office. And he used to be able to do the type of calculations you can do on your PC. Um, these um, nowadays very readily, but um, Th that was his job, you know, calculating anti-reflection coding properties and that kind of thing. And then Ted Spidlak, who um, has played a big role in the development of the photovoltaic industry, as you'll see later. But Ted was doing a PhD in physics here, but decided to bail out and join us, get paid for working. And, um, but he had a sideline in importing T-shirts. 
so <laughs> in the import export business so he had the job of uh, procuring equipment for the laboratories we'd buy secondhand gear from the US Ted would arrange for it you know, would would um, pick the gear and import it and then we'd have a team on deck in these days mainly Eric and Ted that would then commission the equipment here uh, recommission it and the other person there is Ji Chin um, we weren't very familiar with Chinese names in those days, so you'll see, if you can see his name here, actually got his, his given name as the family name in this, um, you know, in, the, in this uh, uh, title for this paper here. But um, uh, Deng Xiaoping had made a very famous speech in China in 1978, where he said, you know, we've got to modernize China, we've got to let our scholars and students go abroad, and he sort of authorized about a thousand or so students to leave China. And Ji Chin was in his very first uh, batch. So um, he, was a, he was not a student, he was a scholar. He came here and he spent three years within our group and very productive years. So um, he sort of made, made it a lot easier for Chinese students and scholars that came later in that he was a very productive member of the team and a very pleasant guy to work with. But that was our first real contact with China. He went back to uh, China in 83 and um, soon after getting this record and uh, I visited him in uh, 84, well, Judy and myself did in Wuhan in uh, China. So this is me in the, one of the labs there with Ji Chin. Um, I gave a three week course there on, on solar cells and these are the professors at uh, Huazong University of Science and Technology there. Last year, I was made an honorary professor at this university, so I've maintained in the talks that I've got there, that, that I've given there, that I'm the longest serving professor at Huazong University because all these guys have now retired and no one has contradicted me so far, so that, that might be true. Um, I had written a textbook, uh, like Stuart said, it took a year or two to get up to speed, but um, after a couple of years, we knew a lot about solar cells. And this textbook, Solar Cells, um, you know, is still in print. It's, uh, it's, still, it's still a good introductory text to the basics of uh, solar cell operation and so on. So I hope many of the students here will get to learn it from one cover to the other. But uh, very interestingly, uh, you can see on the cover of the cell there, of the book there, um, it's got this solar cell and it's the lines that run this way are called fingers and the lines that run the other way are called bus bars. It's got three bus bars. And it was very important in breaking a patent that a Japanese company had on um, three patent bus bar designs. They'd suddenly conceived this in the 90s as a good way of improving the cell performance. And here it was on my book that was published in 1982. Um, the other interesting thing, I turned up to give this course, three-week course, to about 30 Chinese students. And each one of them had a complete photocopy of this book sitting in front of them on the desk. So my publisher would not have been too happy. but. It, it made giving the course a little bit easier. Um, just a bit on the technical side. So this is just the history of solar, silicon solar cell efficiency. So it started way back in the 40s. So by the time we were involved in the 70s, it already had um, you know, decades of development. In these um, years here, it was at Bell Laboratories and spin-off companies from them, mainly for use in the US space program. So the solar cells were used to provide power for satellites and other vehicles. So there's a big effort putting in to get the efficiency high in that era. And then another space, US had this ComSat communication satellite laboratory set up to you know, hone in the technology used in their spacecraft and they gave a further boost. And that's when we arrived on the scene. And you can see from here, if all the red dots are UNSW, we pretty much dominated the subsequent development of the cells, you know, which already had you know, 40 or 50 years development at the time we started making impact. So it wasn't like it was a you know, brand new technology that um, hadn't been looked at closely. Uh, this is a structure that gave us our 18% efficient cell. I won't go into too much detail except mentioning, you know, one thing we found very important was to grow an oxide right along the surface of the cell. And um, you might, if, you, if you took in my earlier slide, you'll see we had it underneath the metal even in our early structures. And we found we, you know, to get the best property, pr properties from this oxide, we needed different thicknesses in different regions. So, you know, we knew this oxide passivation was important. We we're probably one of the first groups worldwide to, to, f to make that finding and to capitalize on it. 
The, uh, the next step forward got us to 19% efficiency. We didn't change the structure too much. You mightn't have noticed the slide turnover, but we've actually, instead of using that thin oxide under the metal, we've made a very small contact between the metal and the, and the uh, silicon material that's all this stuff down here. So that turns out to be a very um, bad area in terms of solar cell performance. So the idea is you keep it small. So that, that seems quite an obvious area to those working in the, air, in the field today, but I believe this is the first publication that ever talked about small area contacts um, to, to improve solar cell performance. It was in fact my very first paper that I uh, wrote on joining the university here in 74. But just using this particular structure here, which we actually used in the first prototypes of this device here, where um, you know you have the metal mainly insulated from the silicon, but allow it to contact in very small areas. So we made devices like this and NASA confirmed they had you know, record voltages and we then incorporated them into our <laughs> record cells. And then we got the big result and that was the first 20% efficient cell that had been established like in this era here as the four minute mile of photovoltaics. So um, something that was out there that was gonna be difficult to achieve and one day someone might get there. Um, so all we did was we added this uh, texture to the top surface to reduce reflection from that top surface and that um, was what pushed us over the 20% efficient mark. The team had grown a bit since then, so this is the team that, uh, most of the team that were responsible for that 20% results. You might recognise a few faces there, but the number of PhD students had grown. So we got Andy two, Stuart three. Zhao was a beneficiary of um, Ji Chin's, um, the, the positive experience we had with Ji Chin. So Zhao wrote to me in the early 80s, you know, can I study with your group? And we knew that Chinese researchers were good, so it's sure, come on over. So uh, Zhao was my fifth PhD student. Mohan came from India, he was number six, and Ji Man was a local, number eight student. Michael took down, he became later enrolled for a PhD, and became my 17th PhD student. And then as well as them, there's um, uh, Ted here, who you've already met, and Mike Willison, who um, was our lab manager for many years. Um, all these people have gone on to do wonderful things in the industry. So you'll see, uh, when I get to later bits of my talk, that um, people from the lab had a, had a big impact in transferring the manufacturing industry from high cost regions of the world, you know, particularly Europe and the US, into Asia. And that's been responsible for the dramatic reduction that we've seen in cell prices over recent years. And a lot of these people sort of spearheaded that uh, transition. So this is just some of the uh, companies I were involved with. So Ted here actually set up the production lines that four of these companies that are listed here in, in China. Based on the skills that he'd picked up buying secondhand gear for us and commission it, he was able to set up these production lines in China on a shoestring compared to, um, you know, just buying one off the shelf. Um, our our um, research then took a slightly different direction. We've been concentrating on the front side of the cell. We started to look at the rear of the cell and um, I'll talk a little bit about this perk cell structure, which is becoming commercially very important. Um, it was first mentioned in these two um, documents down here. So um, when you write a, a grant application, it's not enough just to sort of say, we're gonna incrementally improve the device structure. You've gotta come up with a few way out ideas. It forces you to come out with a few ideas to bring a bit of excitement into the proposal. Now this, this is one of the ideas that I put into the uh, closing grant for this application, you know, like what work can you see in the future that you'd like to do, sort of a section of the, of the final report. And this was actual proposal in response for a request for proposals from what is now NREL in the US. But this was included in both. Um, in this case here, we've done our bus bar with a wire. So this might be another patent breaking um, technique that we've demonstrated here and that there's companies that have since sort of patented this idea of wire bus bars, but we actually made one way back then. But the other um, structure that was included as a way out idea in those reports was this one here. Uh, it looks pretty familiar to most people working on solar cells these days, but it's in fact the perk cell structure. So we started concentrating on the back. So we've just got a bland front in this drawing and a back there. So if you think about it, it ele elegantly incorporates three earlier UNSW ideas. So it's easy to write stuff about it in these grant applications. 
but one of them was the small area contacts. So we keep the area of metal to the silicon contact small through these little openings here. We use oxide surface passivation. I've written insulator there, but we were thinking of oxide at least along the interfacial regions to give you good surface properties that we found were important in our earlier work. And then we use what I call a dielectrically displaced rear reflector. So um, it was hard, as I said, to do, you know, like do very simple, even simple calculations in those days. So looking at the reflective properties of rear metals and everything, you needed to write a program, punch it up in cards, take it up to the computer if you really wanted to analyze. But um, we did, we started doing that type of analysis and we found that having the uh, dielectric between the metal greatly improved its reflective uh, properties. So this is reflection as a function of thickness. We didn't have the capability of growing thick silicon dioxide layers in those days, so we evaporated silicon monoxide instead. And this was a result from one of my uh, undergraduate students' thesis of that era. We actually showed that the experimentally things worked pretty much as our calculations. Um, so they were the three features that um, characterized the, the PERC solar cell. We did our first um, paper on the, on the PERC cell 1989. This is the first publication describing the PERC cell. Um, team of people involved there. And then we explored um, several variations on it. So I won't go into the details there, but there's, these are all the different combinations of what you can do to the rear in the PERC cell structure and, um, and improve the efficiency. So the, the development of the PERC cell sort of divided our research into two phases. The early phases we called our PEST cell, passivated emitter. Emitter means top, passivated top solar cell. And then we did passivated emitter and rear solar cells, which led to this structure here and ultimately to 25% efficiency. The reason I'm talking so much about PERC is that it's starting to transform the whole manufacturing industry. So this is... Um, just a graph from one of the industry an analysis type companies that are bound these days. This is NPD Solar Buzz, August 2014. Just talking about the capacity of high efficiency cell production. There's been two um, long term players in that space. That's been the HIT cell and, and the rear junction cells and manufactured by SunPower. So the blues show their combined output. But a new entrant over recent years has been companies introducing this PERC cell into production with this growing very rapidly. And in fact, what the industry thinks, here we are in the last year, 2014, we've changed colors a bit. The purple and the green correspond to the blue in this one, that's um, the heat and rear junction cell. The PERC by the end of 2014 was about equal in capacity, about 10% of the total manufacturing capacity was PERC last year. Uh, most of it was made, was developed, most of it was manufactured using a technology that was developed uh, by one of the companies we visited on our very first trip to the US, it developed around that era in the 70s, but um, has been the mainstay of production. But over the next few years, expected to be rather rapidly displaced by PERC technology as manufacturers push along the same path we followed for higher and higher efficiency. So we're expecting by 2020 that the majority of production will be the PERC cell that was actually developed here, you know, 25 years earlier. Okay, a little bit about some of the people that were involved. Um, from the, from the uh, early 80s to 1991, we were successful in applying along with other groups for uh, an Australian Research Council Special Research Centre. And the advantage of that is that it provides um, more or less guaranteed funding for a fixed period of time. So you can support the lab infrastructure and so on that you need to be conducting research at the level that we were at that stage. So it, um, you know, very handy funding for us to be able to procure. But unfortunately, only a limited number of these centres given Australian wide. Like I think there was 11 given in this round that we were successful across all disciplines, including medicine and so on. So we had a microelectronics centre, a small part of that. These are some of the people that uh, were on staff around that time or joined us, you know, during that period or, or, or towards the end of it. This is Mark Silver, who's uh, one of our long-term employees as a youngster. Chiman, who's, um, there he is, there, <laughs> next to Zhang <laughs> Um Mark uh, Kivers, 
who's there also in that front row. You'll notice he's got these dark safety glasses on, so we'll see another photo of him with those on a little bit later. Doing some very careful measurements, so, uh, which he also is doing a little bit later. This is Alistair um, Spruill. Um, as a youngster in his lab. And then this is some of us uh, visiting um, NREL or Seri, I'm not sure it was. This is um, Richard uh, Blackbeard Corkish <laughs> and uh, Stuart Wenham here. So the first um, head of um, the uh, School of Photovoltaic and Renewable Energy Engineering and the second head of that school. And Darren is of course head now. And this is Stuart Bowden who heads a research group at the University of Arizona. Another of um, uh, our PhD students, number 22, I think Stuart was. And this is uh, Zhao and Awa. So Zhao was in one of those earlier slides and he was my first uh, Chinese PhD student. And um, um, he, he performed uh, excellently during his PhD studies here. And he asked if we could bring his wife Awa out, which we managed to be able to do. So we had Zhao and Awa as a husband and wife team that took responsibility for our high efficiency work throughout most of the 90s. So they were responsible for pushing the group onwards to 25% efficiency. Um, so um, Zhao and Awa went back to China to establish uh, China Sunergy, which is now one of the big players in the field, making very high efficiency cells, as you might expect. In uh, 1991, we got a, another of these special research centres, but by then photovoltaics had grown enough and um, you know, our reputation, I guess, had grown sufficiently that we were able to be awarded one of these special research centres in its own right, in our own right. And this is a group, so you can see that it's grown a bit more. Stuart had moved up through the ranks and had become uh, deputy director of the, of the special research centre. And you'll notice a few other people, some I've already mentioned, but there's Rob who's organising the filming here today. And uh, Matt, uh, this is Michelle Goulden, now Taylor, who's uh, head of um, new product development at uh, Ergon Energy in Queensland. That was Freaky Ebong. He was my first African student, but he's now uh, academic in the US, North Carolina University, but had a very successful career there. And there might be a few other people you recognise there in the background. Um, the stewards had a very, played a very important role within the centre and uh, one of them has been inspecting modules. So that's been obviously one of his very important tasks. So there he is again, inspecting <laughs> modules, inspecting modules again. <laughs> He's been so good at it that we've even thought of cloning him, but we've got this sort of blurry replica here of him. Uh, but Stuart, during his PhD student, um, we were chatting in our office one afternoon and we came up with the idea of this structure here, the buried contact uh, solar cell. And we saw this as a way of, when we made the 20% efficient cell, of transferring that technology into low cost production. And this actually became the second cell to um, worldwide to surpass that 20% efficiency mark. So uh, Stuart was working with lasers during his thesis and we used lasers to define the contact areas for these cells. So, you know, quite a tidy little structure. Um, this was the first use of those cells. So we, we licensed it to several companies. Not all of them made a, a serious go of it, but this was uh, AEG Telefunken. This was the first licensed use of the cells and the university collected royalties from the sale of the cells that are on the back of this um, solar car. Um, so this was a solar car race from Darwin to Alice Springs. So the next car was by this stage hundreds of kilometres in the, behind. <laughs> the cells had proved so much better than, than the, the cells any other car had that had just blitzed the field. Um, these are my two kids here, um, Morgan, who's there in the front row with a, the with a beard, <laughs> and uh, Bree. So they now have kids that are, quite, are not quite this big, but uh, soon will be. Um, so that was the first licence use, but our most successful licensee was BP Solar. And uh, this was BP Solar first installation in Bern. These are the Houses of Parliament and these cells power a funicular that take the parliamentarians up to the Parliament House. Uh, so the 70s were big hair days for the boys. Uh, 90s, big hair days for the girls. This is my wife, Judy. And uh, little hair days for the guys. Um, but the really first big installation of the very contact cell was um, in Spain. And this was the biggest system in Europe at the time, you know, maybe in the world, but the first one megawatt photovoltaic system in Europe 
used mainly buried contact cells, so over half the field was buried contact cells. So, um, you know, this was one of the proudest days of my life, like this massive field with panels in every direction you could go, all equipped with, with cells that we'd actually had originated in our lab and you knew all the dramas that had gone on between the conception of the structure and then the actual implementation that we saw here. So a very proud moment for me. So BP um, went on to, um, so these, this is this era here. So most of the cells made of this era, you know, like a megawatt a year production or so went into this field here or the, the one in Switzerland, but then BP ramped up production. Eventually they became the largest manufacturer in Europe using the buried contact um, technology around the end of the 80s. And then these numbers look minuscule by present standards, like we're doing 10 megawatts, 20 megawatts, which is really tiny. But you've got to remember the cells were worth at least 10 times more then, so the value of the product was um, you know, much higher than you might imagine. So by the, um, by the time the patents ran out in 2005, there'd been over a billion dollars in sales of product under license to the university of this particular technology. Something really exciting happened around uh, 1998. Um, BP that had done some studies that showed that all you had to do was increase these production volumes from 10 megawatts a year up to 500 megawatts a year and you could lower costs to, to really low values, the types of values that we're seeing today. And it turned out to be correct. So scaling up has been one of the key factors that has been responsible for driving down costs. John Brown was their CEO of the big BP and um, he was keen to push this technology further. So as a first stage in getting to that 500 megawatts, he'd planned to build a 50 megawatt factory here in Australia in, to be uh, commenced in 1998. So you can see 50 megawatts was way off the scale here. So that was a big factory for that era. So we were all assembled in the Opera House. BP had booked the Opera House to announce this. And, um, and all of a sudden we got news that John Brown wasn't coming. It, on the very day he was due to announce this, he announced the merger of BP Solar and Amoco. And uh, Amoco happened to be a company, that, another oil company that was very active in the photovoltaic area. So all of a sudden BP had more photovoltaic capacity than they could handle. And this whole factory I, got scrapped. But something that was very exciting at the time sort of fizzled out. But um, BP kept on manufacturing in Europe um, as indicated here and became one of the leaders in terms of um, the quality of the product that they were offering. Uh, made with that technology. The 90s ended well with um, Stu and I receiving the Australia Prize from the Prime Minister. This was an international award in, in that era and Stu and myself were the only, only the sec second of all Australian team to be awarded the Prime Minister, awarded the Australia Prize. Um, so as a subsequent year they changed to the Prime Minister's Prize and made it exclusively for Australians. So we were the last to win the international award. Okay, so the 2000s was a bit of a turning point. So that's when the photovoltaic industry really started taking off. So before then it was sort of subsidized, small scale application demonstration systems, space systems, remote telecommunications, that kind of thing. Um, also our uh, special research center was coming to an end. They had a nine year lifespan. So we, we hedged our bets by Stuart and myself splitting up. Stuart put in for a key center of photovoltaic engineering uh, which was in, which is involved with teaching and um, near-term commercial research. And I went the opposite direction. I said in, put a, another special research center application in for third generation photovoltaics going the opposite direction, very futuristic photovoltaics, you know, just to differentiate the, you know, what we were doing with the different revenue stream. So we both were successful. So we got both of those up and they operated as two parallel centers for, for several years. This is Torsten here, one of our uh, inspired recruits as a postdoc for this third generation center and Kylie Catchpole who's doing very well as an academic at ANU now. They were our, um, our star postdoctoral recruits for that uh, center. But in 2003 and became the ARC Photovoltaic Center of Excellence with this Center of Excellence scheme a sort of bigger, bolder scheme, replacing the special research center one. So we got involved in teaching through this activity here. And in 2000, we launched our f first courses under the umbrella of this uh, key center. As I said, the, you know, the photovoltaic industry at 2000 was pretty small. 
And this is sh this is showing the new electricity generation capacity being installed worldwide as a function of the type of technology. So, you know, around the you know for the last century and early parts of this century, most of that was based on fossil fuels like coal, gas, and oil. These grey areas down the bottom, some hydro, particularly in China, the big hydro schemes like the like the Three Gorges um, hydro scheme, massive hydro scheme there. Wind started coming online in the um, early 2000s um, and then photovoltaic sort of nowhere to be seen in 2006 but by 2013 when this plot was done starting to become a sizable contribute, contributor to the new electricity generation mix but according to this forecast by Bloomberg you know destined to become the largest over the next decade or two these both these yellow regions represent photovoltaics in different applications while we see a decline in the traditional uh, electricity generation capacity. So this, this sort of viewpoint of what's going to happen in the power industry becoming more and more widely accepted. So it's very rare to find people that don't subscribe to this viewpoint. Um, perhaps uh, in the Australian government you might find a few, but outside of that it would be difficult to find people within the industry that don't believe photovoltaics can have a large impact. Because costs are low now, but it's still early days. It's still um, huge potential for further costs. I better move on a bit because I want to finish in about five, ten minutes. But um, we started this education program and here's Alistair and Richard with a um, cohort of our students. We had our first graduates in 2004. This was actually the world's first undergraduate program in um, photovoltaic engineering. And, you know, we picked our timing pretty well because, you know, the, the market might have kept just sort of piddling along at a very small level, but instead it grew exponentially. So we were able to field graduates at the time that the industry needed them. So our intake grew quite uh, rapidly. This is the number of students. So when I did this graph in 2012, we had over 600 students enrolled in different programs, our PV engineering and a broader renewable engineering degree or in our postgraduate um, course and uh, research programs. We now have over 120 PhD students, which would be um, the largest by far of any university uh, worldwide in the photovoltaic area. Uh, along the way, we developed several books. This is my book I showed you earlier, published in 1982, but it lives on as the red book shown here. But we've got the blue book, green book, third generation book that sort of provided the rationale for the center we established with that title in the early 2000s. And then um, resource book for high school students that Rob and Stuart put together and help from a few others around here. Um, so, you know, so we, these books are widely used and been translated into many languages and so on, um, and used around the world. Um, we've had a big impact in the technical sense, as I've tried to indicate, but our biggest impact may be in terms of the graduates that we've produced from here. So I'll just talk a little bit about them. I've only got photos from recent graduates because it wasn't as easy, I guess, in the 70s and 80s to take selfies of um, <laughs> groups like this. Um, so those are just some of the recent graduates from our group. Our most famous graduate is here today, but uh, that's Zheng Rong. Um, he's, he was my 12th PhD student graduating in 1992, but Zheng Rong became the first solar billionaire. Uh, so this is Zheng Rong as a, as a young student here. The only photo I could find of him. And this is actually our buried contact cells that he's holding there. And this is Stuart and me helping uh, Zheng Rong lay the foundations for his second factory in uh, China. So uh, we did a little bit of shoveling, but we didn't hang around the whole day to complete the job. <laughs> and then Zheng Rong, um, his company became the largest in the world. And this is him appearing on the cover of the equivalent of Time magazine for the industry, Photon International, as the head of the company that was the world's largest manufacturer in 2010. Um, Zheng Rong uh, established this industry. There had been some manufacturing in China. In fact, uh, Zheng Rong and myself had visited uh, China with David Hogg, who some might know, to look for opportunities for um, establishing our very contact technology uh, within China. But the, the operations were all very marginal and um, struggling to uh, keep, stay in existence. But Zheng Rong turned all that around. And this is what I call uh, his billion dollar recipe. He might be able to <laughs> add a bit more color to this, but um, this is what I, my impression of what was going on. 
So Zhengrong organised local capital. Uh, it wasn't a huge amount, like it was like 10 million bucks that he organised locally with help from the local uh, provincial and uh, city council. Um, this, this is the bit that became important. It happened automatically for Zhengrong. We had an ex-UNSW um, person as a senior position, CTO or CEO, and you'll see why that was needed. You get into production on a shoestring, you know, like using the second-hand equipment, whatever you can scrounge. Um, you have your products internationally certified, which Zhengrong was very quick to do, so you could sell on the international market, and you establish a cash flow through selling on the international market. And then you float on one of the US exchanges. So Zhengrong picked the New York Stock Exchange, although other people who followed this recipe picked NASDAQ. Um, and then you end up with a billion dollar company after you get these <laughs> investors flooding to invest in you. And Zhengrong was the first to use this recipe, but uh, about uh, six or seven other companies very quickly followed from China with the same recipe. But because they were raising the money in the US, this step was really very important. The US investors had to be sure that due diligence had been, due diligence had been done and there was contact to sound technology within the organisation. So having a CTO that had UNSW credentials was one of the boxes that had to be ticked off before they would sign on to, um, to get involved with a, an initiative like this. So all these companies here followed Zhengong's recipe and very quickly and you'll see, you know, most of them are the big Chinese companies. So they're all private companies. So, um, you know, this notion that the Chinese government is flooding the market with solar cells, it, you know, they tried to do that, but they failed because these companies were too strong. But it's all, all um, manufacturing, the ma majority of manufacturing in the world is occurring by these privately owned Chinese companies um, that are listed mainly on the US exchanges. Um, oh yeah, I'll just go back uh, if I can. Yeah, so this was ringing the bell in um, December 2005. So um, uh, there was actually five Australians on the podium. And so there's me, and this is my wife Judy, who's down here at the front here today, Jeng Rong and his wife Vivian, and there's Stuart at the back there. Um, there's three Americans, Amy, John Thane, who's here, and Catherine Cannell, is it, uh, who was the um, uh, president of the New York Stock Exchange at the time. And there was five Chinese. This is Mr. Wong, the mayor of Wuxi, who, who played a big role in organising the early support for Zheng Rong and getting him off the ground. Um, my name in Chinese um, is Ma Ding. The characters are Ma Ding, and Ma means horse. So I always have been and always will be the horse professor, as far as <laughs> Mr. Wong is concerned. <laughs> so quite a character. Um, I'm standing next to uh, John Thane, who was the CEO of the Stock Exchange at that time. He went on to become CEO of Merrill Lynch on a, on a remuneration package of 120 million a year, and very famously uh, spent one million bucks equipping his office at Merrill Lynch. <laughs> he subsequently ended up paying for that out of his 120 million rather than out of company funds because there was so much of a stink course. Okay, but, but there's others that followed this route. So this is Zhao, who you've met a couple of times. He, he floated his company on NASDAQ, you know, Zheng Rong. This is Xi Min Dai, Dai, so you don't have to be a bloke. She was she CTO of uh, JA Solar, which is now second biggest manufacturer, I think, worldwide, and so on. So um, we've seen a dramatic uh, cost reduction in photovoltaics over the last seven years in particular, like the cost has come down by a factor of seven. And, and this transition of the manufacturing to China was largely responsible for it. So if you look at the, major, the countries that played the major role in this emergence of PV, you'll see that there's four main players. Now, Germany perhaps played the most important role in that they established the political framework that created the market for photovoltaics. So they had a feed-in tariff program that was very well conceived that established a, a steadily growing market for the photovoltaic product that manufacturers could rely on. Um, China was important in that they provided uh, the uh, capacity to expand production quickly and uh, the low cost labour and so on that was needed in the early stages of the industry expansion. Um, the US was important because the successful Chinese companies have almost invariably been, been floated on the US exchanges. So they provided the investment that allowed these companies to grow in the Chinese environment. So 
the US provided the support through, through dollars. But Australia provided the expertise that was needed to make all that happen by providing the founders, the CTOs, et cetera, for these companies that then had to establish the technology and um, you know, get a commercially viable product out onto the market. So we can be proudly, we can be proud of the role that we played in, um, you know, in making photovoltaics a reality. So one role I see for our center is sort of as the technology hub for the Asian Pacific region. You know, these are some of the companies that we now have strong links through, through um, to through um, former students that now hold senior positions. So not only in China, but in Taiwan, um, Singapore and Korea have very strong connections. I'll, I'll finish up. Oh, the timing's not too bad. Uh, just a few landmark or headline achievements of the lab over the year. So over the years, uh, I'm doing this because we got one of, our, one of them just very recently last uh, October. But um, in 1985, I already mentioned our 20% efficient silicon cell. That was like the four minute mile of photovoltaics. And we then um, rounded up a, a series of other uh, successively more challenging 20% uh, efficiency targets. So we actually used these cells in a system like this where you focus the sunlight down onto a smaller area of cell. So if you um, just try and convert the direct component of sunlight, it turns out you can do that more efficiently because that has very low entropy for those of you into thermodynamics. So it just um, follows from the physics that you should be able to convert it more efficiently. So you shine sun, direct sunlight onto these lenses and it gets focused out of the cell. We made the first photovoltaic system that looked a bit like this. This is not an actual photo that uh, converted sunlight with 20% efficiency in 1989. And then for a standard module, which is more like the thing you'd put on the roof of your home, we got that a little bit later because it was more difficult, 93. 98, we got the first 20% multi-crystalline cell. That's the standard commercial low cost material. We're using high quality cells for these results here, high quality source material, but this was this low cost commercial grade material. 25% efficiency in 2008. And then just at the end of last year, we got 40%. So from 89 to 2014, we managed to double the efficiency of systems like this that rely on focused sunlight. We're aiming for a few more. So we want to get a 30% module like this sometime this year. So it's up to Mark Kivas. <laughs> um, and then we think we might be able to get 40% with that a little bit further down the track. Uh, this is our 40% um, result. I promised I'd show you Mark again with his protective dark glasses, but this time he's on the roof of this building with this system here. And it's a prototype for a, a system shown here where you have a large field of mirrors and focus the light onto some solar cells that are located at the central tower. So Mark was using this mirror here to focus light onto the solar cells that are down this end here. So this is just a drawing showing the solar cells. But by splitting the sunlight up into its different colors, we were able to uh, improve the efficiency beyond that that had been done before. And this was the first demonstration of a conversion of sunlight <coughs> into electricity with greater than 40% efficiency. Mark uh, measured it on this roof, I think on this particular day, 22nd of October. And then he went off to the US with this in, all packaged in a massive suitcase and uh, had the efficiency confirmed at uh, NREL there. This whole project's uh, again supported by ARENA. So it actually, um, you know, potential to make political impact, actually featured as a Kathy um, Wilcox uh, cartoon in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, great news, our scientists have achieved 40% efficiency. Perhaps the first time photovoltaic cells has ever appeared in a, in a cartoon in a major newspaper. <laughs> Okay, well that brings us to the end of the talk, so I thank everyone for your attention. I thank uh, all the people that have contributed to that work. I probably forgot to mention a few of you who have done really great stuff, but sorry if I have. But um, thanks all and thanks for everyone for coming along. I'd be happy to answer a question or two if anyone has one. Yes, Mark. Um, so Mark is our new dean, incidentally. <laughs> Certainly a very impressive 40 years, and I've probably got to say that to, to quite a few people here. You've given the rest of the, the science recipe, scientific recipe, and you gave Jen Rong's recipe, but what I can't help noticing is the, the recipe of building up the team and keeping that going. What's that? <laughs> well, 
it, it needs you to work hard in putting in grant applications. <laughs> 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 and, and the other aspect of that is, you know, you have to cover your bases. So you have to put in two grant applications where you really only have to put in one if you knew it was going to be successful. So if both of those get up, you then have the potential to grow. So um, by trying to secure the future of the people that we had been able to organize funding for, by successfully putting in generation of generation of research grants, we have been able to not only maintain the size of the team, but um, you know, through most of our history, we've had this um, slow growth um, you know, to our activities as a consequence of that. So you often have to look to broader and broader fields. So you know, we've tapped into funding from different places around the world, including the US, to to sort of support our growth. Good recipe. Write the great application. <laughs> the money. Yes. A question. Uh, I didn't see Pacific Solar mentioned from the ninety four, ninety five. 2000. Yeah, it was, it was in my uh, earlier talk, but uh, just got a little bit, uh, you know, I wouldn't have had the time to explain, but uh, that was something we were quite proud of. We were one of the few companies to actually get a thin film product onto the market, um, which is a great achievement from the researchers involved, but work by Zhengrong and our other students sort of unraveled that work in that the cost of the standard product became so cheap that the thin film products uh, could no longer compete with the standard products. So we all thought that the thin film products would get onto the market and be so low cost that the, the standard wafer based silicon technology wouldn't be able to compete. But we were wrong through um, efforts like Zhengrong's, with Zhengrong's company, the cost has been taken out of the wafer technology and it's now the thin film companies that can't compete. So I had a graph with about seven companies that were competing neck and neck in the early 2000s for market share but all but one of those has disappeared. There's only one sort of viable thin film company on the market at the present. Okay, if there's no more questions, I, I just want to add an extra comment to um, the Dean's question about, you know, how do you succeed in having a group not just exist for such a long period of time, but actually grow during that period of time? And I think, you know, I can't find another example in any field anywhere in terms of trying to do what Martin has actually done because one of the challenges of having a group like this for its first 30 years before we had our, our own undergraduate engineering degree, more than 90% of our staff the entire time had to be employed on year by year research grants, right? So you only need one bad year and that's the end of your group, right? And so as Martin mentioned, he always had to put in more grants than what were needed, just in case one failed, because otherwise it would lead to the end of the group. What Martin didn't tell you is that over that 30 period, Martin had a 100% success rate with his grant applications to the Australian Research Council, right? So Martin would always put in an extra in case one was unsuccessful, but the new one was always successful, so the group always grew, right? And so the challenge for Martin also grew. And as that happened, the group got larger and larger, more and more mouths to feed. And eventually, we got our own undergraduate engineering degree. And I guess that took a lot of pressure off because that meant, as a big change, we now had a lot of tenured academics able to be employed by the university with permanent positions that were no longer solely dependent on Martin winning his ARC grants year by year. But I think Martin's success in the ARC scheme is unparalleled anywhere in Australia in any field. And I think there's plenty of evidence for that, which I, I talked about before when we had Martin's celebration for the 40 years, where you know, I mentioned the fact that you know, when they looked at the success of ARC grant winners Australia-wide, Martin was easily number one, right? So I think all of us who are part of this group today um, have so much to thank Martin for, and also the great presentation today. Thanks. Thank you.